Talk about sexual morality. In today's world, we are seeing various standards of it, right? I mean, we are seeing different campaigns going out there, Me Too, uh, different scandals coming out, different people being accused of sexual harassment, uh, different types of, you know, weird behavior, strange behavior that used to be totally unacceptable in society is becoming acceptable now in some societies, right? So who really gets to define it, right? What is acceptable, what are what are we accepting as a society, right? So even if you remove any religious boundaries, most people, for example, would not accept adultery, right? They do see that as a very uh, inappropriate and very cruel and unjust thing to do, right? But then who is it that has the right to define what is a sexual morality, right? What is acceptable for the society? So think about this. Who really has that right, right? Actually, um, as I was looking at something that, you know, is accepted all across the board uh, I even found that there's certain people who are arguing in defense and on the acceptance of adultery if you really go for live and let live right I mean in that situation there's really no boundary right so if uh, if we do take that option if we do take that definition that look you know adultery is an accepted uh, form of sexual immorality Right. And, you know, if a spouse does that, then he or she is violating the rights of the spouse. Right. So if you take that, then think about it. OK, so a husband or a wife has this route that that their uh, partner, their spouse should not use their body in a way that is displeasing to them. Right. They have exclusive access to that. OK. But if, if you accept that, then what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created all of us? What is his right, right? So imagine how a spouse feels if his wife or her husband cheats on them, right? How would they feel? But imagine now, walillahi al-mathal ala for Allah is the greatest example, right? How would Allah, how are, what are we doing to Allah? What are we doing against Allah when we violate this right of Allah, when we violate this religion of Allah, when we violate this boundary of Allah? right? How low are we falling? So think about that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and defines in Surah Al-Mu'minun when he says, you know, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Certainly, indeed, verily, definitely, the believers have succeeded, right? And he defines several qualities of who true believers are, right? And then one of those qualities is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing. He says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ And they are the ones who guard their private parts. إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ So by default, it is something... Private, right? You're supposed to guard it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they got it except the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible, right? So the ones that you, for example, take in marriage, right? So if you have committed to the obligation, to the rights of a marriage bond in the name of Allah, then it is permissible, right? And so on and so forth. So this is, Allah is the one who has the right, who has the uh, who has the wisdom, who has the knowledge, who has the perfection to be able to even say that and to be able to even demand that. So now we also, from a perspective of how we were looking at the book, The Disease and the Cure, right, by Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, we are already on the chapter of Az-Zina, the illegal, the impermissible sexual activity. So now, basically, we are on that chapter and he is describing how much of an evil, how much great this sin is, that this is from one of the major sins. Right, and then he's describing that in his book. Now, one of the things that he says is that this happens, this act uh, of cheating, this act of adultery, this act happens in four stages. Right? He will define those four stages, and then he'll talk about those four stages. Today, we'll describe those four stages, but we'll only talk about the first stage. So he says, "Look, this starts with a look. Right? This starts with an impermissible look, which." brings about thoughts and ideas which leads to words which leads to deep and repeated thoughts then desire then will and the will becomes an established intention right which finally becomes an action 
And when we say action, we are talking about the sin, the great sin of zina, right? So it's talking about all these different stages, right? And in a way, these are these four stages of looks, thoughts, words, and then steps, okay? And then the finally the sin happens, right? So today we'll be talking about the look. So from the advice, from the instruction of the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the hadith in which he is reported to have said, O Ali, do not follow a glance with another, for you will be forgiven for the first, but not for the second, right? So if you have a lustful desire on opposite gender, right, the first one is forgiven, right? But when you intentionally do look again, then it's not forgiven, right? Now, well, let me just first of all talk about how so many people make fun of this, right? Or oh, just keep your first one longer, right? I mean, this is off topic here, but this also comes in how we mock religion, right? So it's an it's instruction from the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is talking, who is telling us on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can we mock with that, right? I mean, do we really have to make fun of everything? This could be a very serious issue. Right? And, and I see that many people do that with many other things as well, right? I mean, sometimes people are just having fun about, let's say, you know, the Android and iPhone debate, and they're like, oh, astaghfirullah, you use iPhone. Like, astaghfirullah is a dua that we are asking Allah to forgive us, right? Do you intend to say that, or just you jokingly saying that? I mean, this is a serious thing. I mean, are you confident that Allah is happy with you mocking and taking these words lightly? I know I'm going off topic, but this is a serious thing to think about. Okay, coming back about lowering gaze. Okay, now, look, we are not uh, scholars here trying to give fatwas, right? And we talked about it in our last episode when we were talking about a strategy, and we talked about the danger of innovation, and we talked about the importance of taking information and guidance from respected scholars who have the knowledge, who have the credentials, who have the experience, who have the trust of the ummah. Right, so we would say like you, you go back and you you understand it from your own scholars. What does lowering the gaze means, right? I mean, obviously there are people who are on, you know, both extremes here, right? You know, there are ways, there are places, there are situations in which it's permissible to look, right? How much, how long, how less? It depends on the situation. The asal is it's forbidden, right? That you don't look at non mahram women, for example, right? But there are situations that may allow that based on the need, based on your own uh, personality, based on your own conduct, based on your le- your fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so forth. But again, this is not for me to dictate and it's not for us to you know make fun of each other, but it's important for us to go ahead and you know verify that and learn it and get it from trusted scholars. Okay, so, so we've talked about that, right? And then... Um, you know, he goes on to explain a lot about this um, in his book about what is the dangers of having a look, right? And it's much better and much easier to intercept it at the first instance, which is the look. It's much easier to be patient on preventing oneself from looking than to prevent oneself when the desires have already developed. When the person is has high desires and it's very intense and he's very passionate, but he cannot get it. Right, due to various reasons, and then it's very hard to be patient on that. Right. Likewise, if there is a situation in which one is already addicted to watching inappropriate content, right, and this is something to think about. That you know, why is that happening? What emotional need uh, is the person meeting when he or she opens and watches things that are impermissible? Right. And you know, there could be various ways of dealing with that. Obviously, first is to discipline oneself secondly you think about what is it that they're missing what emotional need or what um what what is it that they're trying to fulfill in their life right Uh, is it because they're feeling loneliness is it because they're feeling a lack of purpose so it's much better for them to go ahead and you know build those um constructive behavior and constructive solution to those problems as opposed to going for the destruction